unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. Heavenly Father, today, your God, as I come again, I'm asking you, dear Lord, to anoint these lips of clay. Help me to bring forth your word that we understand what you have for us today. And Lord, I give you praise and give you glory. We love you and honor you. And thank you for everything. Thank you for what you're doing, dear God. Lord, I just can't express this morning what I feel in my spirit. Knowing, dear Lord, that you are working things out. And we continue trusting and believing and thanking you for it right now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. This church, I'm not preaching to the church down the street. This church must have one main focus and that is the saving of lost souls that should be our main focus this morning in this church is to see souls saved added to the kingdom of God come on I'm not looking for numbers for the church I'm looking for souls to be saved we don't need more entertainment Come on. Or more pats on the back for our own salvation and faithfulness. We need to pray God. We need to pray God gives and give us a burden for the lost. Yes. Come on. That's what you and I need to have this morning yes. is a burden for the lost. The most prolific writer of the New Testament was the Apostle Paul as he wrote many letters to the church of his day. How much he thought of the church that would be around in 2019, I don't know. I don't know. But the words he was inspired to write are eternal. And they reach out to us right now just as powerful as they did when he wrote them. Amen. Can I get an amen in here amen. this morning? Yeah, amen. They were just as powerful then when the Holy Spirit gave them to him the right. Are they? They are today. Paul had come a long way from being one who persecuted the church to being converted on the road to Damascus and being filled with the Holy Ghost prior to stepping out onto the pages of church history as the apostle for the Gentiles. Amen. Come on. But Paul, who had been trained in the greatest schools of Israel was trained on the law of Moses. At one place, he refers to himself as a Pharisee.
Pharisee among the Pharisees. Meaning that no one could beat him at the knowledge of the law and how to force men to comply with it. He was a great debater, Paul was. He was a great debater even at one point taking on seekers of mysteries among the great thinkers of the Greeks on Mars Hill where he declared unto them the Lord Jesus Christ as the one they knew only as the unknown God. One thing that Paul had was a heart after God. Come on. When he was converted, he got the real thing. Amen. Amen. When I gave my heart to the Lord, church, I got the real thing. Yes. Amen. Amen. There's, a, there's a lot of churches today, people sitting in the church, and God help us. Amen. I'm not here to down them, but I'm here to, to let you know there's a lot of people today that don't have the real thing. And I'm glad this morning that we've got the right message, and it's Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Yes. They don't have the right thing. Paul, when he got saved, he got the right thing. This gospel was no plaything to him. When he gave his heart and he gave his soul to Jesus, he did so without reservation. Committing his life to the preaching of the gospel at all costs. And not only that, church, but he counted everything as loss in this world. So that he might comprehend all that he could about Jesus and have a greater revelation of the power of the Holy Spirit. One man fully committed and sold out to God under the anointing of the Holy Ghost laid the foundation of the church. Come on. Upon the same foundation that Jesus had laid for there, there's no other foundation that will stand the test of time and eternity. I'm laying the foundation right now. Breaking the ground for this. The words that He spoke revealed the very heart and nature to Jesus. To a world that was lost and dying a sin of darkness. As I look around today, I will see the same world. Come on. I said as we look around today, we say, see that same world out there. It is lost and dying world. Steeped in the idolatry and wandering around without eyes to see, ears to hear, and unable to come to the truth of the gospel, which was the power to see men free. It's a sad thing to look around. Everywhere you go, and into the eyes of people you meet and know that the great majority of them are living without the hope of eternal life. The worst part about it is that you don't know that they don't even know, church, that they are blind and that they are being led astray to a far off of the cliff of life into the pits of the flames of hell. Many go there daily. Come on, I'm not saying this bragging. But many go there daily and there they will remain forever and forever. What a terrible thought to know that the very people how many of you went to Walmart last night? 
Anybody? All right. Some did. But I want you to think about this the last time you go to next time you go to Walmart. The very people you see at Walmart today may be burning in the pits of hell tomorrow. I want you to think about that. Come on. We go and we go and we talk to people at, at the store. But when's the last time that you looked at that person, that cashier, and say, can I ask you something? Do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? Or no, we get complaining because they're in a bad mood. Well, maybe that person needs to know that Jesus loves them. Come on, church. That person that you made, that ran into your cart, and don't want to say, excuse me, and you look them in the eye. Today, maybe tomorrow, they're in the pits of hell. Because nobody, come on, church, nobody took time out to say, do you know Jesus? Somebody took time out for you and I. Might have been our parents that took us to church, but I thank God that I had prayed mom and dad that took me to church. Where those people that you will see today, when you go out to eat, you may see them today, but tomorrow they may be in the hell because they don't know Jesus. Lord, are you hearing me this morning? <coughs> As I see this, I'm reminded of the words that Paul wrote in the book of Romans as he looked at the spiritual blindness, as he looked at the hopelessness, hopeless darkness that which engulfed his own people in Israel. Paul seen, seen, saw them as men walking blind in a deep spiritual darkness. As men grasping for straws of hope, but never having a full reassurance and hope of being delivered because the truth that would give them freedom was completely rejected. Come on. You can sense the sorrow, the concern of their souls. And Paul's great, his heart given to him by Christ as he spoke about the lost condition of his fellow man. And that's why I want to talk about it, just for a few moments longer. The cry of a Christian heart. The cry of yours and mine who claims to be born again believers. There ought to be a cry coming from our heart. Amen? Paul said, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. I want to tell you that this prayer and this heart's desire should be in the very in every one of us right now. Yes, amen. 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 Come on. You ought to have well, me and my poor are no more. It ain't going to get it with God. Come on. You ought to have a desire in your heart to see somebody say it. Yes, amen. A desire for the souls out there. I know that we are all concerned about lost souls, especially those of our own household. Come on, get, a, get a, amen. 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 We are concerned about the condition of our nation and of other nations and the people around the world. Like Paul, our heart's cry is, Lord, send a mighty revival. Send the outpouring of the last days. 
Send the wave of reformation one more time. So many are lost and they need salvation. My prayer every day is, Lord, draw people into your kingdom. Help us to be strong and ready to reach out to everyone we can. Come on. Sister Angela, those you, we can't go anywhere without you run into somebody that knows you. I just don't want to run into people to somebody who knows me. I want to run into those who are lost. That I have an opportunity to say, do you know Jesus? Do you know He loves you? Do you know He cares for you? Come on. Church, I want to do everything that I can under the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost to see souls saved in this year. To see them added to God's kingdom. Whether they come here or not, it's all right. But as long as they say, Lord, I surrender, give it all to you. Amen. And their name is written down in the book of life. That's all that matters. Seeing souls saved. Come on. We ought to have that desire as Paul had that desire for Israel. He had a cry, a heart cry for the people. And that's the way we should be. Yes, church, I am concerned about the sick. Yes, I do care about seeing our brothers and sisters in the church being blessed. But nothing is more important than the saving of the lost. Amen. I see the soul. I see the soul saved even if the body is not healed. Come on. It's always the main object and I believe it should always be first priority. What eternal good is the healing of our diseases if our heart isn't right with God? Amen. I've seen them coming. Amen. I've been in this pastoring for quite a while now. I've seen them come in. Their heart not being right with God. And God would heal them. And I asked God, why? Why did you heal them for? Their heart's not right. Because they go right back out there and do it worse. Come on. If God never heals me again, that's great. That's all right. I'm still going to serve Him. Amen. Amen. I'm still going to love Him. I'm still going to praise Him. Yes. I'm still going to glorify Him. Yes, I'm concerned about the souls. I'm concerned about healing. I know God can heal. But folks, He'll hear me this morning. I'd rather see somebody saved. Amen and not get healed and make heaven their home. Because when they get over yonder, amen, they will get their healing. Yes, they will get a glorified body. Yes. They will get a new body. Amen? Yes, amen. Many times it not only serves to allow the sinner to live longer, to commit more sin if they get healed. May God give us a heart for reaching the lost and leading them to Christ. That's the ultimate form of healing. Yes, Amen. Amen. If the heart and the soul are made right with God, then that life that is given is eternal. Yes, the saving of the soul is the greatest miracle of healing. Amen. 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 And deliverance that anyone could ever experience in their life. Why? Because it's faith in what Jesus did on the cross. Who alone has the power to cleanse us from all sin and bring us into a right relationship with our Father in heaven. What is our cry, heart's cry today? What is your heart's cry today? Are you sitting there going, shut up, stomach, I'll feed you here a little bit? Amen. <laughs> or is your heart's cry as I want to go out and witness to somebody? Hey Amen. I want to see souls <laughs> say, come on, church. That should be our cry today. That we're wanting souls to be saved.
saved? Are we crying out for America? Are we crying out on behalf of our church? Do we know that our priority is not those things? As important as they are, our priority is the saving of souls. The impact that one conversion to Christ can make is immeasurable. Huh? Come on. That person that you can lead to the Lord may be the next minister, could be the next youth leader, could be the next, amen, whoever God wants to use. But we got to do our part. Yes, amen. Come on. We got to do our part. We got to witness to them. We got to tell them. Paul had that desire right here, and we are to be Christ like. And he was Christ like. And he had that desire. Come on, church, there's going to be some changes made. There's things going to be different. Come on. And we reach the lost out there. Churches all around us are growing leaps and bounds. But where is the spirit at? Come on. Where's the truth at? Here. The impact. <coughs> that one soul. One soul. Brought to Christ and changed by the power of God. Can change the whole picture. To God's power working in them. <coughs> I pray for our government. And for the church. But my prayer is always focused on that man and woman who sits in the seat of authority. That God will get a hold of their hearts and bring them to the point of being saved. May a revival strike our nation that brings congressmen and women, judges and presidents, and every other leader to their knees in repentance and acceptance of Jesus Christ as Lord. Church, you and I and they will bend their knees at one some point. Yes, amen. 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 So why not now? Yes. Amen. Huh? What would this nation be like if we had a whole bunch of Holy Ghost field men and women in the Congress? Wow. Wow. Huh? You say that's that's impossible. No. Nothing's impossible with my God. Huh? And how is these people going to get that way? It's through the true church. Or bombarding God and saying, God, our congressmen, our congresswomen. Come on, how many of you saw the, 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 the State of the Union address? I did. It was sad. The disrespect that our president do I agree with everything he says and does? No. But I pray for him. Yes. That God will lead him. Amen. But for people to disrespect him under his authority. <coughs> Come on. <coughs> I'm going to tell you something. You know what? I love our president. I pray for him. But you know what? I've got more authority than he does. Anybody who's called to preach the Word of God has more authority than any president in the world. Amen. Come on. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. And I'm not boasting about that. But I'm telling you here today, what would it be like if our congressmen and women and all those senators in the world that we have that we voted in were on fire for God? Wow. What could this? What could God put me through with these people? But we got to pray for them. We got to pray for them. Well, I don't like them. Well, maybe they don't like you either. <laughs> but the Bible says to pray for them that despise and use you. Come on, Just pray for them, church. Guess what? They've got a soul just like you and I do. Huh? And God saved you. 
Hello? He did save them. Amen. Come on, let me let me let me go get get into this. Here. Israel didn't receive the knowledge of what they had done and what they had been given. It was inconceivable to them that they had murdered, had murdered, murdered their own Messiah. They had sought and prayed for the Lord to come for generations. Come on. But when He came, they rejected Him. Huh? Don't pray for something when it shows up. Well, God, that's not exactly how I want it. You must not have been hearing me right. Huh? No, God knows what you need of before you ask. Yes. What He gave you is what you need, not what you want. <laughs> then when the Lord showed up, they rejected Him. Come on! They turned away from Him. I wonder how many... Let me back up here. Here. No one is above the power of the Holy Ghost to reach in and stir their hearts. I said, no one is above the power of the Holy Ghost to reach in their hearts and stir their hearts. They have the ability to reject Him. Amen? But God knows how to get their attention. You can reject Him all you want, God knows how to get your attention. As I examine the church, I wonder how many among us are going to happen. How many are truly sold out and on fire for God? How many have fallen on their face in repentance and are seeking God's presence above all else? I hope that it is all who walk in those doors. But I know in reality that not all are ready. Come on. I've seen them come through those doors and the Holy Spirit is tugging at their hearts and they're still right back out. Come on, church. There's a lot of people who fall in the same category as Israel did when Paul looked out over the nation and saw that their spiritual condition was gone. He said in verse 2, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. As Paul looked upon Israel, he saw the people that were searching and were hungry, but they were looking for answers in the wrong places. Israel thought then, and many still do, that their hope was in obedience to the law of Moses. Obedience to the law and the creation of good works in their lives was the ultimate goal. Like the rich young ruler who went to Jesus by night, they were willing to obey every law, to do whatever was required for them of them as payment for their sin, <coughs> except for one thing. And that thing was a complete and full commitment to God of Jesus Christ of everything. What does that mean? It means a sellout. Like Paul, counting it all as long so that we may know Jesus. Israel didn't receive the knowledge, come on, of what they had done and what they had been given. It was inconceivable to them that they would have murdered their own Messiah. They rejected Him in the same manner today. Men seek for answers in life's questions 
Try to find the meaning of life. Try to find a way of life that is fulfilling. Attempt to search the truth, but never find it. They search in all the wrong places and all the wrong things. <coughs> huh? You got a question this morning? Right here's your answer. Yes. Amen. Open this up. Nothing of this world, church, can answer those questions. Nothing of the law could save. Jesus said, I come not to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. Yes. Only by having their eyes open and being given a new revelation of Jesus Christ could their understanding be enlightened enough to accept Jesus as Lord. All the zeal in the world cannot save a soul unless that zeal is placed in the right thing. And I thank God that God gave uh, uh, Paul the right message. Yes, sir. Amen? Amen? You can have, you can love church, but the church can't save you. <coughs> You can have love. You can love worship in the songs that we sing and worship in the Lord. But worship can't save you. You can love everything about the religion, but it has no power to save. Only the Lord Jesus Christ and faith in His blood that was shed for yours and my sin and repentance for sin, and the exception of Jesus. Surrendering your heart and life to Him completely can save you. Yes, uh -huh. Verse 3, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now watch here. People could have the zeal to do a lot of good things. But as I said before, if their zeal is a place of the righteousness of Christ, along through the, His shed blood, then that zeal will accomplish little to nothing. That is, if any zeal in the kingdom of God will carry no reward in heaven in the judgment. Those whose self-driven zeal and desire to do good things will find themselves standing before the righteous judge and being condemned instead of receiving praise. Too late, they will discover that the good news of this life outside the righteousness of Christ are nothing in the mind of God. If your faith is not in Jesus, come on, come on, you will have nothing there will be nothing in the mind of God for you. <clears throat> People can have a good heart to work in the medical profession, bringing help and healing as their motto to a hurting world. People can have a good heart desiring to see justice in the earth through the political means of economic means or economic means, but where is Christ in their plans and works? People can have a good heart to help people in every way. And it's all good in the eyes of man. No people on earth have had more of a zeal for obedience to the law of God than Israel did. They, were, had, they have created laws to support the laws of God in every tip. To not offend the, those laws. In other words, church, it's just like today. We're living in the, the Bible days today. Well, if we got ten laws and they're good, let's make another ten laws. So they just kept making laws over laws over laws. Huh? And that's what it is today. You better pray. You better pray. Come on. You better pray that these on the left, this green wave that's going on. Huh? 
Have you been watching the news? I'm going to say something now. I know you're going to lunch your first second. They want to do away with all the cows now. Because the gas that the cows pass is destroying our environment. So in other words, they can't go out there and poop. Are you hearing me? I, it's not funny. It's, it's true. This is how stupid they're going to put a law over law over law. It was then, back then. That's why Israel followed with law. Those who didn't bring the law, they were all right. Yeah, you can't fix stupid. <laughs> now, let me, let, me, let me get here. So, if they don't accept that a Messiah would come, and they didn't place their faith in Jesus' power to fulfill the requirements of law in them, then all of their zeal for the law was of no consequence. For it only served to condemn them even more. Christ must be our focus. Amen. Only His righteousness can save both the Jew and Gentile. It's Jesus' blood and nothing else. Amen? Amen. Now, verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. I know I'm preaching to those who already believe, but I feel compelled to repeat it time and time again. Our only righteousness is in Christ, who alone is our righteousness. Amen? He alone is able to save to the uttermost. We cannot count on anything or anyone else. It's Christ and Him crucified, risen from the dead, and ascended into the heaven. That's what it's all about. I died with Him, I was buried with Him, and I rose with Him, and I'm alive today. Looking around, my heart cries out for those who are counting on anything else. Men are walking blindly in spiritual darkness, unable to comprehend the true condition of the heart and life. Unable to recognize the precarious situation of the eternal soul. In other words, church, the word says the blind will lead the blind, and they will both fall in the ditch. They are blinded by their own sin. Their own pride. And their refusal to believe the truth of the gospel. Which is the, their only hope. As I said a couple weeks ago, on Wednesday night or whatever it was, <coughs> there's a lot of people without Jesus, they have no hope. If you don't have Jesus, you have no hope. I've got hope this morning, church. Why? Because I believe in who He is. And I've accepted Him as my Lord and Savior. He is in me and I am in Him. Amen. Amen. Every man is going to do that which is right in their own eyes. And everyone seems convinced that their eternal destiny is already set in heaven. No one at any funeral... Oh, hear me now ever wants to think that their loved one is in the pits of hell. No one. I've been at many funerals, preached many funerals. No one wants to, for the minister to stand up there and tell them that their loved one is in hell. Right? No one wants it. No matter how ungodly they have lived, Everyone wants to say that they are in a better place. Amen. Amen. 
That's what they'll say. Well, he's in a better place. He's in a better place. Where is that place? If it's in hell, it's not a better place. I don't want to bring them more grief by reminding them, but they aren't in a better place. They are in hell while we try to say, say good words. Families and friends grieve over the loss, but walk away and soon forget that every one of them will have their turn in that casket. Many times in ways we try to jar people into reality. Look upon them for the last time. For if they don't make heaven your home, you will see them no more. I often wonder if I'm even too soft. But I do know that most wouldn't hear it anyway. I like to tell them the truth that there are no relationships of love in the pits of the flame. There are no friendly conversations and expressions of care and concern down there, folks. There's only suffering, pain, loneliness, and the constant sense of dying, but never really dying. Have you ever burnt your finger or something with, with a match or lighter or burning trash or whatever? And that pain, that's what that pain's going to feel like all over your whole body and there's nothing you can do about it. But we want a sugar coat. Come on, let's, it's time for the church to tell them yes. what it's like. Yes, amen. Don't tell them that they're in a better place. But tell them before they get to that place. What we're going to do, let's do it on this side of the grave. Amen. Let's go wait till, come on. I've always, told, always been told, give your flowers now while they're alive. So they can enjoy it. Come on, the church has got to have a burden for the lost. Well, I know how they are. They're just so mean that there's no way they're going to get saved. That's a wrong attitude. Maybe somebody thought you that way too, about you. Uh-huh. And now look at you. You're in the church worshiping the Lord. Come on, if He can do it for one, He can do it. If He can save me, He can save anybody. I'll use myself. Come on, church. we got to have a cry. Our hearts got to cry for the loss out here. In other words, we need to get into their face. When I gave my heart back to the Lord, I told you, told some of you this, some of you have never heard of it, but if the rest of you heard it, just sit along, just listen. My brother, I, my older brother, dad was on his deathbed, and I gave my heart to the Lord back to the Lord. Started serving the Lord. I haven't turned back since. And I, I went to my brother. He was a little bigger than I was. Meaner than I was. And I said, if you don't get saved, then you're right. That's the attitude I had. You're going to go to hell. And if it wasn't for Dad, he'd probably, I'd been picking myself off the floor because he was ready to hit me. <laughs> it was true. But with a wrong attitude. Come on. Well, God, Pastor, how do I talk to you? Ask God. Come on, be sensitive to the Spirit. Huh? But open your mouth. How are they going to know that they're lost? That they're going to hell if you don't tell them? Without hope, they're going to hell. With hope, they'll have eternal life with Jesus Christ. Now, are we going to win everybody over for the Lord? No. No, if I stand here and say, yes, you, you can, I'm a liar. Some are going to reject it. That's where you pray God get a hold of their heart, stir their heart up. Huh? 
I've, I've talked to a pastor until I'm blue in the face. I'm not going to talk to him anymore. That maybe that next time will do it. Don't give up. Don't give up. Amen? Let, Amen. Me, close. Let me close. Let me close here. There are no friendly conversations, church. The message of Jesus Christ in Him crucified must go forth. <clears throat> Lord, help us to not be quiet about it. The souls of men and women are at stake. It grieves me greatly to think of lost souls dying all the time. And yet, it is the very thing that spears me onward in doing what God has called me to do. For if I preach not the gospel, I shrink my duties in the Lord. Where would that leave me? I'd be the same in the same boat as those who rejected the Lord of God. All that we do as we work for the kingdom of God, every prayer we pray, every song we sing, every child we teach, every church service we attend, every sermon I preach, every work that we do in this life must be based on that one cry of the heart of every Christian. Our heart's desires and prayer to God for Israel and for all mankind is that they might be saved. Let us never get our eyes off of this single purpose in life. Tell people about Jesus. That's God's desire and it must be our desire as well. Let me close. Let us pray that we never lose this focus. We cannot become so focused inwardly recondemning one another to one another or patting one another on the back for our faithfulness, edifying number and love and forgetting that there are so many who know not the love of God. Come on, what are you saying? Let's don't just pat ourselves on the back. Let's go out there and tell them. Let us pray that we will always cry out every day for the lost. Let us never miss one chance to, sell, to tell a soul about Jesus. Let us not be judge or jury over the lost. But let's lead them to the Lord who can deliver them. That's our primary mission after we are born again. Thank God for our salvation, but remember, church, to pass it on. I'm going to have a sign made up. I, I, I believe I was the one who had that sign made up over there, the other church. But I'm going to have it made up again, put it over the door. When you, when you leave that door, you are entering the mission field. Come on. You didn't get me. You didn't hear me. When you go out those doors to go to your vehicle, you are entering the mission field. The mission field's not in here. Come on. It's out there. And when you leave today, wherever you go, at home or out to eat or whatever, I pray that this message sticks to you. That you'll see somebody and you'll tell them about Jesus. And you will have that pride of a Christian's heart as Paul had for Israel. That's the same cry that you and I got to have. Amen? This, every one of us right here this morning would win somebody over for the Lord. And even it brought them to church the next time. What do you think? Come on. Let's add unto the kingdom of God. Whether they come here or not, doesn't matter. Just as long as their name is written down in the book of life. Amen. Amen.
Not everybody's going to come here to church. Why? Because of the building. That don't look like a church. Looks like a little storefront building. Well, that's what it is. Got to start somewhere. Huh? Let me say something. I know it's going to be true. When God moves us to a bigger church, and I believe that we're going to build, and you got two nickels to rub together, but I believe, okay? And we're going to build as a nice, beautiful church. Yes. And those who said, this don't look like a church. Oh, oh. oh, Pastor Jerry, you got anything that I can do in the church? Are you hearing me? Mm -hmm. They'll want to be a part of it. Huh? I don't serve the building. Yeah. What matters is what was on the inside. Yes. Huh? The message that we're preaching. Amen? Not the building. I thank God that we have this building here that we rent every month. Come on. <coughs> and I'm tired of renting. I believe that I know that I know that I know. God is working things out. Yes. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on. But what if we told somebody today, invited them to church? Come on. Don't depend. Come on. My job is to disciple you. My job is to preach the word. Your job as disciples is to go out. Amen. Come on. Yes, it's my job. I do I do talk to people. Huh? But it's your job as disciples to compel them to come in. Compel them to come in. That's what the Bible says. Welcome to the byways and the highways and the byways and compel them. Yes. But does compel me? Make them come in. Come on. But I pray for this church, and I'm praying for you, that you and I will have a cry. Our hearts cry as a Christian. We'll have such a cry going forth now. Go back to what I said earlier in this service. I didn't know what the Lord meant. And I believe that's what it is. I believe that's what it is. When God laid on my heart in the first year, and I kept wondering, God, is this what you want? He said, tell the church to be sensitive to my spirit. And Sister Angela, through her reading this week, just, just Thursday, I believe it was, or yesterday, Friday, my days are mixed up. She goes, i got to share something with you. She goes, this is what the Lord laid on my heart as I was reading. I believe that he laid on your heart. He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen? We're living in that last day, church. But let's be sensitive to what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen? I pray that you truly enjoyed that message. And I would like to give you an opportunity, if you're strayed away from the Lord or feel that you would like to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I just ask that you would repeat this simple little prayer with me today. And all you got to do is believe in your heart that the Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior and you can be born again today. So if you would, just repeat this little prayer with me. Dear God in heaven, I come to you today as a lost sinner. You, dear God, said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I am asking you, dear God, to save my soul and to cleanse me from all sin. I am accepting Jesus Christ into my heart and what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary in order to purchase my redemption. I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, 
and believe in my heart that you, God, raised Jesus from the dead. I have called upon your name as you have said, and I believe that right now I am saved. If you repeated that with me and believe in your heart, you are saved today. 